Hello, I'm Derek Walker and I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church and today we're continuing our series on the ABCs of faith and in particular we're in that part of the series called Faith Works. You see we're talking about how important it is for us to act on our faith, to do the word as well as hearing it. You know it's unhealthy isn't it to be just feeding all the time and never doing anything and so just as physical strength to comes to us, you see, by eating food. So faith, which is spiritual strength, comes to us by hearing the word. And as well as hearing the word, as well as feeding, we must use that strength. We must exercise our faith. We must release it by our actions. Otherwise, it's unfruitful. You see, having heard the word, we must observe to do it, making a diligent effort to implement it in our life to put it into practice, so that our life is aligned with the will and purpose of God, which then allows his life to flow. It's only as we do it, you see, does the power flow. And to put God's word into practice, I believe the major key is to cultivate the right attitude of humility towards the word of God, so that we submit ourselves to it and obey it. We submit in our heart to it, and then we obey it in our life. But until we have the right attitude of humility and submission to the Word of God, we're not going to actually do it. Um, we won't actually overcome the flesh and do it. You see, we've got to have this attitude. The Bible is not a book of good suggestions to us from a friend, from men. Um, and then we can just choose and pick the best bits that we like and ignore the rest. But it's a book of promises and commandments from the Lord God Almighty. And so we need to approach it with the attitude that this is not the word of men, but the word of God. The Bible calls this the fear of the Lord. When the Bible commands something, do we just take it as a suggestion that we can shelve for now? Uh, or do we immediately respond by saying, I'll do it. How can I put this into practice in my life? Or do we maybe think, well, you know, that's a good idea, Lord, but I think I'll, I've got some ideas of my own that I want to try out first. And then maybe I'll do it. When everything is, when I feel like it, when all the ducks line up, is that our attitude? You know, questioning the meaning of the Bible is, is absolutely fine. The Bible says we must test all things because there's so much deception around there. We can, we can misunderstand what the Bible is actually saying. But once you clearly understand the message of the Bible, what God is saying to you, then the time for discussion is over and the time for action has come. Because only when you actually do the Bible is the blessing released. The problem that we face, that we all face, is that at the fall, man chose to be his own God to go his own way in pride, to live by the knowledge within himself of good and evil, and without reference to God, rather than living in submission to God and his revealed will. And we all inherited this sin nature from Adam. As Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And so man became a rebel against God, against the God who only loved him. And one of the effects of this is the formation of pride in our soul. Uh, we, this is a tendency to operate by our own strength, by our own wisdom, rather than trusting in God, rather than obeying God. And without Christ, we would be hopelessly lost and under God's judgment, part of a rebel kingdom against God. This, this thing in our soul is called the independence power of the soul which we have to lay down and, and humble ourselves, as Jesus said, daily, and, and have the attitude of, no, I'm going to do what God says, not out of the strength of my own soul. Well, I want to tell you a parable to understand the situation better and how important it is for us to come and bow our will and bow our knee to Jesus Christ as our Lord and to humble ourselves before his word. You see, this is a parable of a rebel kingdom, um, of a rebellion uh, that took place one time, one in, in a land far away, you might say. Uh, it was ruled by a loving king, 
and his son, the prince. And this was a prosperous and a peaceful kingdom. And the rebellion broke out, however, led by a powerful, charismatic leader, saying, follow me. I'll give you much more freedom to do what you want to do. The king is too strict. He's holding you back. He's stopping you fulfill your potential. Follow me and I'll make it much better for you. And so many were convinced and they rebelled and they fought against this, this good king. But things didn't go well for the rebels. And uh, these promises were empty promises. Life was hard for, for them outside the kingdom. Now the king was powerful and uh, he could have immediately destroyed them all. Uh, but he chose not to because he loved them. And uh, even though they believed these lies about him, actually they blamed him for their misfortunes that were actually, they brought it on themselves. And, uh, but although they had made themselves his enemies, the king wanted to win them back. He didn't destroy them. He didn't want to destroy them. But the problem is that justice, he was also a king of justice, and justice meant that he could not let this rebellion go on forever. And so what, would, what did he do? Well, he delayed his judgment in order to win, try and win them back into his kingdom. So the king and his son came up with a plan to save these rebels that would satisfy justice now, justice required that their sin be punished. And so they came up with a plan that by substitution, the king's son would take their place and pay the penalty for their crimes. And he would pay it in full by his death. He voluntarily suffered death for these rebels. And then the word was sent out to the rebels. The king is offering you a free pardon, forgiveness, full restoration back as a citizen in the kingdom, just as if you'd never sinned. He will wipe the slate clean because the king's son has paid the penalty for your sins. And he will restore your honor, your position, your dignity in the kingdom. But all you have to do is accept his offer. You need to personally come to the king in faith. Of course, it had to be in faith. He, they had to believe it was a genuine offer because otherwise, if it wasn't, uh, you know, they would be destroyed if they returned to the king. And so the, the news went out that they had to come to the king in faith and accept his free pardon. And that involved, of course, that they would also have to accept the king's authority over their life. They would have to bow their knee before his throne and accept him as their king. They had to repent, in other words, of their rebellion. Well, some didn't believe, of course, they thought maybe it was too good to be true. And as a result, judgment would fall on them. They had refused their only hope of salvation. But some did believe. They did return. They did bow. And with gratitude, they received their forgiveness. And they confessed him as their Lord. And this is the gospel, if you haven't guessed already, that this is what happened to you when you were saved if indeed you are saved, because you can only be saved by personally coming to the king and receiving your salvation and confessing him as your Lord. This step of faith, you see, of salvation is to receive the free gift of salvation and I want you to notice it involves accepting his authority over your life, accepting his lordship. And that's why we say that we receive Christ as our Lord and our Savior. So we repent of our sinful rebellion against God, rejecting his authority, going our own way. We, we repent of that. And we also repent of trusting in ourselves for salvation, but rather we trust in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And that's a saving faith that involves both a trust in Christ and a surrender to Christ. That's why the devil isn't saved. Even though he has faith, he believes in God, he's never surrendered his will and accepted the Lordship of Christ. So we trust in Christ alone for salvation and we surrender to him as our Lord. And that's why salvation verses will often talk about the Lordship of Christ. Acts 16.31, believe on, trust on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 
He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's the confession and the acceptance that Jesus is your Lord that is crucial. It says, All who call on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. You call on him as your Lord. And so we belong to him now. He is our Lord, and we are bought with his blood. We're not our own. And you know, it would be unthinkable, wouldn't it, in that story, for those who come and accept the king's pardon to then go away and continue on as rebels against the king, living independently from the kingdom, fighting against the king. You see, having bowed their knee to the king, they are now back in the kingdom. And now they've got to learn a whole new lifestyle of not, rather than living as rebels, living as citizens of the kingdom. Well, they've got to learn the laws of the kingdom. And so, once we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have bowed our knee. We've accepted in principle that Jesus is our Lord. Now, we may not be perfect. We've got to learn what it means to live in the kingdom. But the first thing we need to do is this central truth is that we need to learn the attitude of a servant. Having bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus, our primary attitude is now, he is our Lord and we are his servant. We are no longer independent rebels. And we need to cultivate that attitude towards his word because now we're in the kingdom. His word now speaks to us. He tells us what his laws are, what his ways are. And we now come with that humble attitude to, to, to do what he says. And so the servant humbles himself under his Lord, given up his independence, and he adjusts now his life to hear and obey the word. I want to tell you, take you to an interesting passage in Luke chapter 17, which tells us what it means to be a true servant. You know, he, Jesus gave a clear command in verse 3. He told them, take heed to yourself. If a brother sins against you, by all means, confront it, rebuke it. And if he repents, if he says, I'm sorry, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Now actually, this person, it really isn't very repentant, because he keeps doing the same things <laughs> again and again. He says he's repented, but he clearly hasn't repented, because he keeps doing it. Just imagine someone went up to you and punched you, and they immediately, and you said, ow, and they said, I'm sorry, brother, please forgive me. Okay, I forgive you. And then 10 minutes later, they come back and they punch you again, even harder. And before you can complain, they say, oh, I'm sorry, brother, please forgive me. And they forgive me. And this keeps happening. Do you know, Jesus is saying, forgive that person, even if he does it seven times in a day, uh, even if he's not really repentant. You forgive him. And, uh, you know, it's so easy, isn't it, when someone is, who's close to us keeps sinning in that certain way that we form a root of bitterness against them. And Jesus gives a command here, forgive, walk in forgiveness. In verse 5, understandably, all of these apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. They're basically saying, Lord, it's too hard, you know, not now, I'll do it one day. They, they don't have the attitude of a servant, you see. If God gives a command, that's the end of discussion. But the, de the problem is our independence rises up. We have all kinds of reasons and complaints and reasons why we can't do it now. And so they say, Lord, increase our faith. We're not ready yet. We're not strong enough yet. We can't do that now. I'll do it one day when I've got more strength, maybe in the future. Meanwhile, Lord, increase our faith. Meet my needs. Spoil me. Pander to my needs, Lord. I'm not ready yet. And this was not the attitude of a servant. It's interesting in Acts 10, Jesus said to Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord. No, Lord. Now that's a contradiction, isn't it? No, Lord. If he is Lord, then it's yes, Lord. We are not his independent equal. We are his servant. And once he's made his command clear, there is no more discussion. That's the right attitude. When God tells us to do something like forgiven, we don't, do we say, well, that's a good idea, Lord. I'm, I know I should, but I'm not quite in the place to do that yet. I don't feel like it. 
I think I need to develop a bigger theology of forgiveness. You know, there are reasons why, you know, I, he, that person doesn't deserve to be All these excuses come up. No. Remember, this is not a friend giving you a suggestion. This is your Lord commanding you. This is not take it or leave it. The Lord has told you to forgive, and that should be the end of the discussion. But if you're fighting that, then it shows that you haven't cultivated that attitude of a servant yet. You see, when the Lord has spoken clearly, there's no, no more discussion. I love the word amen in the Bible. Jesus used it 99 times. You see, nine is the number of finality in judgments, the last digit. And amen has a number value of 99, and it happens 99 times in the New Testament. And Jesus often s translated it, amen, amen, I say to you, or surely, surely, I say to you. And, that, and God stamped it with all these nines to say, this is finality. This word means finality, amen. Well, that, it's surely, that settles it. It's the end of discussion. And anything else past that point is sin. See, if, if God says amen, that's it. That's the attitude we need to say. When we say amen, we're saying, yes, that's it. You've spoken, Lord, I now obey. We need to trust God's goodness, that he knows what's best. You know, if God commands you to do something, then he gives you the grace to fulfill it with that command. You know? They said, increase our faith. Feed us with some more word. Let me listen to teaching on this for another year, and then I'll do it. Then I'll start to forgive. Well, what would you think of a servant who laid around all day, and whenever the master told him to do something, oh, I can't do anything yet, I'm not strong enough, I need to be fed more. That's treating God as your servant. And Jesus was upset with servants that did nothing. Yes, he does feed us to give us strength, but actually we only become stronger by actually doing it. And so that was Jesus' response. He didn't let them get away with that. He said, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, the smallest of the seeds that they knew about, you can say to this sycamine tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. Now the sycamine tree is a picture of a root of bitterness. It had long, deep, deep roots. And Jesus said, if you've got this root of bitterness, you're going to have to use your faith and forgive that person and speak to that sycamine tree and command it to be pulled up out of your heart and be thrown in the sea. And Jesus was saying, they were saying, increase our faith, Lord. And Jesus was saying, you don't need more faith. You don't need a big faith. You need a, just a small bit of faith in a big God, a mustard seed of faith. And then you could speak. In other words, what you need to do is use the faith that you've got and speak forgiveness and cast out that bitter root. And then God's power will be released. And then as you exercise your faith, that's how your faith will grow. We need to have that servant attitude that doesn't reason, doesn't argue, but just goes ahead and does it. And then Jesus described the proper attitude of a servant. He said, which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he's come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? Will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I've eaten and drunk and afterward you'll eat and drink? See, the Lord looks after the servant. Yes, he does get fed. But his, the servant's first priority is to do the will of the Lord. Not as an afterthought when his own needs, needs have been met. Yes, we do need to feed on God's word. But that's not an excuse not to serve and obey him. And then he said, does he thank that servant because he didn't do, because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you've done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have, we have done what our duty was to do. Now this bothered me because he was a profitable servant. He worked hard. He, he you know, it sounds like he says, oh, I'm useless. I'm a worm. But this word is, doesn't mean that. It literally means Unprofitable means without need, or better, unworthy of any special reward. He's saying, you don't owe me anything. We've only done 
what we ought to do. This was the servant's attitude. You see, for instance, what, so let's say you, go, you come to work on time for three days in a row, and you start bragging in the office, and you start saying, look at me, I've ki- fulfilled my hours now for the last three days, and you're expecting rewards and praises from the boss. No, you're just doing what you ought to do. And that should be our attitude is when we obey God, not saying, look at me, I'm God, you're going to have to give me special favors now because I've done this. Because, aren't I so wonderful that I actually obeyed you? No, you've only done what you ought to do. That's the attitude of a servant. Our, most, our servant relationship with God is not of two equals. I've done something for God, so now he owes me a special reward. No, that's a, that's a wrong attitude. We are his servants. What we do for him is what we only ought to do. He owes us nothing. We owe him everything, you see. And we owe him obedience. And we must not think we're equals and whenever we do something, he owes us some kind of special reward. You know, uh, some merit points. I'm just doing what I ought to do. That's the humility of a servant that we need to have. Otherwise, we get into pride. Every time we do something right, we get into pride and think we're doing God favors that he must reward. You know, I've worked hard in the fields, Lord, so now you're going to have to pamper me before I do anything else for you. You know, this is the wrong attitude. He's our Lord, not our equal. We must repent of that wrong attitude. Um, Obedience for a servant is not an optional extra after our own needs are met, uh, when conditions are perfect. Uh, deserving special praise but this is what we ought to do by virtue of our relationship you see now these verses describe the the essential relationship of a servant to his master but it's not the whole truth about our relationship with the Lord because he's an amazing a gracious master and the amazing thing is although he is our Lord and we owe him total obedience we are his servants Uh, And he's not obligated to do anything for us when we obey him, when we serve him. But, however, in grace, he does go beyond that relationship. And he does reward us. And he does give us special rewards when we serve him. You know, Jesus himself said, "You, you know, you say I'm your Lord and Master, and so I am. But here I am washing your feet. You see, Jesus goes beyond that relationship is true. We, he is our Lord and Master, and, but he is very gracious and he serves us and he goes beyond what he needs to do. He, in grace, he goes beyond that. But we should not presume upon that, take advantage of that, because it doesn't change the fact that he is our Lord. We are his servant and we owe him our obedience. He does reward us great generously whenever we serve him but it's all of grace the rewards that we receive in eternity are rewards of grace it's not that we've earned or deserved them because we would get puny rewards if that was the case they are not payment for what we've done but they are rewards of grace that God chooses to give us freely and they are generous they are infinite they are eternal rewards and but we got no claim on those rewards because essentially we're only doing what we ought to do. That's why the 24 elders cast their crowns before the Lord in heaven, because they know they are not earned, that they're theirs because they've earned them, but they are gifts of grace, and so they freely offer them back to God. They're saying, this glory that you've given us, Lord, it really belongs to you. We have no claim, but by his grace, every act of obedience does become a precious stone in our crown. You see, some people object to the doctrine of rewards because they say that's a selfish motivation to serve God. Now, if we're talking about eternal sex with uh, eternal virgins, that would be a fair enough point because that's an appeal to the flesh. But we're talking about serving God with a pure motive of wanting to praise, please him and we want to receive his praise, his reward. We look for the praise of God rather than the praise of men in the, re- the reward of a love servant of God, you see, is the praise of his Lord, that he's pleased him. He wants to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. 
And if his desire is to please God with his life, then he will have great eternal joy knowing that, that God's pleasure is on his life. And so eternal rewards are not some sweetie that God appeals to our flesh with, but they are intrinsic to servanthood. They are the reward for those who glorify God in their life. Uh, this person who wants to glorify God is rewarded by giving greater glory to glorify God with throughout eternity. If he's been faithful in some area of responsibility, then God will open up more opportunities to serve him in eternity, more authority to serve him. That's his reward. It's not selfish, you see, because the reward is the ability to give and to serve and to love and to glorify God even more, a greater capacity. And so God's rewards are not payments you know, as if God owed us anything. They are rewards of grace. Jesus said, I'm coming soon. I'm coming quickly to reward everyone according to his work. God is gracious to reward our every good work done in obeying and serving him. But his amazing grace is not an excuse not to be submitted to him as a humble servant. Let's have the attitude of a servant. Let's not mess around with the word. Pick the bits we like and avoid the rest. He s says, humble yourself before the Lord as a servant. Once God has made his will clear to you, just do it, and his grace will be there to help you do that. 